you essentially turn yourself and other people into characters. And the more people kind of react to those characters or tell me how they relate to those characters, the more distant I think I feel from who that character was originally supposed to be. I'm Michael Tambler, CEO of Fracton Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is Hua Xu, writer for The New Yorker and author of Stay True, a memoir. It is a heartfelt, thoughtful book about family, friendship, figuring out who you are. It's become kind of a phenomenon. So we are extra delighted that we get to speak with him about it today. Hua Xu, welcome to Kobo. So great to be here. Thanks, Michael. Can I just ask, in this moment right now, uh, how do you feel about 90s rock band Pearl Jam? I actually get this question a lot because in the book, I make fun of Pearl Jam quite a bit. But I, I just wanted to be clear that that is like the 19-year-old's assessment. I'm not a significantly, like, I, I'm not like a huge fan of theirs now, but I will admit that they have like three or four songs I listen to quite often. So it was kind of a bit when I was a teenager that uh, <laughs> sort of lasted into uh, middle age. The reason that I ask is, you know, this is a book about growing up, about figuring out who you are and what you're into and, and what you don't like, but tolerate because friendships are important. Yeah. And, and what we give each other when we get close to people and, uh, and as you say, this is this is one of the things that you use to to define yourself at a certain age in time. As a memoir, Stay True has a fascinating structure. We start with your youth, where your dad provides a kind of gravitational center. Then there's your early adulthood when you meet Ken, your friend. And then there's the grief and time after Ken's death. I'm I'm interested first in just looking at how this coalesced for you as a book. How did these pieces come together? Uh, you know, I I started the book. I didn't know it was a book, but I started writing stuff essentially in the immediate aftermath of Ken's death when I was 21. Uh, I was in college. And, you know, at the time, I was just very much stuck in that moment like I was really trying to process the grief. I was feeling the grief all my friends were feeling um, at this loss. And it really wasn't until much later in life that I realized, maybe it's silly that it took me so long to realize that, you know, that we learn how to be people. We learn our sort of emotional um, framework. Uh, we learn kind of how to be empathetic. We learn how to love so much of that comes from your family, you know, from watching your parents. Um, I didn't anticipate going so far back when I set out to write this. I was very much just fixated on this moment, you know, this night, this friendship. But I think as the process went on, I realized that it was sort of important to communicate who I was, not just based on the sort of petty dislikes as a teenager I would adopt to distinguish myself from my friends. You know, like if if you guys like Red Hot Chili Peppers, I'm gonna hate Red Hot Chili Peppers, even though I secretly kind of like them. Um, that it, that it required me to just sort of go a little bit further back and and think about like my father and my mother and ways in which they had taught me to expect certain things out of the world. Speaking of your father, you went to school in the United States. He built a career there, and then went back to Taiwan for work. And you write about going to the airport and seeing your friends also dropping off their dads to go yeah. back across the Pacific for work. For him, for you know, leaving you in California, going back to the country that he'd left, was that a personal choice? Was it part of of an economic trend? What what made that a return visit instead of uh, a one way trip? You know, I don't. I'm not sure he ever explained it to me. You know, it was just sort of posed to me as like, this is this is what needs to be done. Um, it, you know, it was an out of economic necessity, but not necessarily because we wouldn't have been able to, you know, pay the rent otherwise. Like, okay. I think it was just that he had hit a certain, um, you know, 
ceiling in the American sort of corporate world that he was in. And all of a sudden, there were these opportunities in Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is a place he'd left, you know, in the 1970s. Like he didn't necessarily anticipate returning, and particularly not for work. Like when he left, it was still, uh, I, he would describe it as like a, a rather like poor place, like when he was when he was younger. So, you know, he left seeking economic opportunity. He had no real roadmap for what the future would bring. But, you know, by the 1980s, I think he pretty much figured like, well, we're just Americans now. And so when this opportunity arose to return to Taiwan to be part of the semiconductor industry, which I think people know a lot more about now than they did in the 1980s or 1990s, I think it was exciting for him. Um, it wasn't an easy decision, but, you know, at the time it was just, uh, you know, it was, it, it was actually kind of normal in my, in my, uh, in my circles, like growing up in Silicon Valley, like I write in the book, sometimes I would go to the airport and just run into other kids who were also dropping their dads off because they worked in Taiwan. So I spent a lot of time and time there as a kid. Um, he would come back and forth, but, uh, you know, I think because we had no real uh, precedent, you know, like because we were all figuring out how to be these like, for lack of a term, Americans together, yeah. you know, it's not like I had, it's not like we'd been in, in the United States for like generations, you know, so it didn't seem odd really to have this um, trans-Pacific upbringing where we were going back and forth because it's not like, I grew up in some kind of idyllic town that you know in in a house that had been our, in our gener in our, in our family for four generations. You know, it just sort of right. seemed normal in a way. A thread that runs through "Stay True" is you keeping in touch with your dad while he was away, which was facilitated by a fax machine. And this was the 1990s when fax machines were still very much a thing, but it wasn't generally used as a form of parent-child communication, <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least not from anybody I need. So can you tell me about, about your dad and how you knew him through this form of communication? Yeah, it's funny. So we got a fax machine or we got two fax machines and he would help me with my math homework because I was pretty helpless at math and he was very good at it. Uh, and he would also just ask me questions about what was going on in middle school, what was going on in high school, what was going on in the United States. I would tell him like what bands I was into, you know, how how things are going. Um, and I reprint some of these faxes in the book. Uh, it's funny ever like since the book's been out, like I have I've gotten a lot of like kind of random messages from people who kind of vibe with certain parts. But I've actually heard from quite a few people who had it, the exact same upbringing. In terms of like, you know, their their parents sending them faxes from from Asia, they had fax machine parents. Yeah, yeah, they had fa they had fax parents as well. Um, you know, it's I don't think I had really thought about him or knew him uh, very well as a teenager because I was a teenager, and I think it's sort of the the right of the teenager to just be. A little self-absorbed, you know, in, in curious about your parents. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you're just sort of like you're curious about your parents. Maybe not in the most meaningful ways, but um, I don't think at the time I was I was reading his faxes as closely as or, or with as much intention as like he was writing them because he was constantly asking me questions about the future. Question like asking me questions about why I liked the things I liked or sort of what my passions were. And he was really very encouraging in, in a lot of these faxes. Um, he's always asking me questions and it's not something I really appreciated. You know, at the time I was, I was kind of like, well, all right, all right, here's the math homework, copy the answer, and then write a couple, write a couple sentences back, you know, just kind of answering the, the easiest questions he'd asked. It wasn't until much later, uh, when I reread them, because my family somehow kept them, not not out of any like deep archival impulse, like they just happened to still be around. It wasn't until then I realized how he was really trying to connect and reach out, um, even though uh, it was very difficult at the time. Well, you'll you'll be happy to know, as 
you know, for me as a um, a parent who's now parenting via text message with kids who've gone <laughs> off to college, the skill set is essentially the same. Right. So, <laughs> and and certainly one of the things that I resonated with from your you know from your father's perspective is there is that like you know you're reaching for how are you feeling how are you doing what's going on in your life what are the what are the things that are important to you yeah you're getting back like two word answers yeah yeah absolutely but it with your father now and it, and i think we we find out all the ways in which we are our dads as we you know, as we grow older and in the book there's a there's a clear parallel of your your father just being such an open-hearted music fan you becoming a guy who's you know into being into things um but are there things that surprise you about uh either how you've become like your dad or how you're mirroring some of the behaviors that that he showed to you uh, you know one thing that surprised me a little bit is is when he when i found the faxes I was so I was so moved. I was like, oh my God, he was really trying. You know, I was a teenager. He was trying to, you know, teach me how to become a man, you know, even though, even though he he didn't quite understand what it meant to be like an American man, you know. Yeah. And meanwhile, uh, you know, like I I found them and I, I go up to him and I'm like, wow, dad, like thank you for <laughs> for all all this work you put in that I did. I'm sorry I didn't appreciate this at the time. And he just sort of looked at them and laughed and said, why do we still have these? And he didn't remember necessarily writing any of these. Right. Uh, uh, you know, he didn't remember anything. He he remembered doing it, obviously, but he didn't remember it um, as this gesture of sort of like this yearning for connection that I had sort of projected, you know. And so, um, you know, that's not that surprising because I think he was just trying to survive and mm -hmm. I'm the writer. So I'm obviously trying to like, tell a story about this moment. Um, it has been sort of useful though. I am a father now and I think it, you just kind of have to accept that when you're young, you're not necessarily going to appreciate the things that, uh, that like the older person wants you to appreciate, uh -huh. you know, and that just sort of the nature, that's just the, the way of the world. Like there's no, obviously in the book that goes in different directions because there's like a sense of loss that I'm trying to cope with as well. And, and, and that, that sort of gets refracted through this like element of uh, the, these notions of grief and mourning, but you know, like a kid is just a kid and I can't really expect my, my son to appreciate things the way, like I look back and think like, oh, I really wish I'd appreciate that. Like, you know, you just have to kind of take kids where they are. You as a young man at college is is someone that I could certainly identify with that idea of defining yourself by what you're not into, by what you have a critique about as as much or more than than what you're into. But that's I think that's kind of the surface layer of of the description you give us. Can you can you describe a little more, you know, that person at that time yeah i think i think i was pretty typical in a way i mean um i think what's funny about thinking about one's youth is and particularly because in my book i have an investment in uh seeming un, like unique you know because yeah. because like i bothered to write a book about myself um but there's there's probably something like incredibly generic about my my positions and uh, sort of how I I define myself in opposition to people. Like I am not the only person to have made zines or made mixtapes in the 1990s, uh, but these were very central to kind of how I identified myself. Like I just believed in this kind of DIY bespoke culture, uh, you know, being a little skeptical of the mainstream. Uh, you know, there's a there's a huge portion in the book about like being really into Nirvana in 1991. You know, like 200 million people were into Nirvana by the end of 19 you know 92. So uh, it's it's not necessarily that I 
I was that different, but like I felt like I was different. And I I sought out spaces and forms of taste and texts that would like make me feel like I was being very different. Does that make sense? It was a music at a time that could make 200 million people feel like they were the first people ever to hear that, get to hear that and feel that. Yeah, absolutely. Tell me about first meeting Ken. So I was a, I started college in 1995, fall of 1995. And I think when I went, I went to Berkeley and I think I assumed that like the day I'd, I, 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 the day I would show up, I would just instantly find all of these people I'd been looking for. Because that's why you go to Berkeley. Yeah, like people who are into all the exact same things I was into, you know, like foreign films and zines and buying music on like seven inch single rather than CD, um, you know, just sort of all of these people who had the same uh, you know, people who are in like critical theory and philosophy and and sort of conspiracy and things like that. And, you know, I, I didn't really find these people immediately. And I I like, you know, my my roommates, they'd been friends from high school. Like I like the people around me, but I hadn't really found the people that I thought I was meant to find. And Ken was definitely not one of these people I thought I had come to college to find. Like he was just seemed like an an incredibly mainstream person at a time when that was the the one quality I avoided. You know, like I did not read popular books. I did not go to see the blockbuster movie. If I did, it would be sort of with reluctance, with a with a sort of exaggerated reluctance. And so to meet someone who was just really confident and like in a fraternity and into like Pearl Jam and sort of these bands that I had sworn off um you know it it was not it, it he was not someone that i actively want to become friends with but he lived a couple floors up he sort of seemed to understand me or at least find me interesting in a way that um i kind of appreciated like he sort of understood that deep down inside a lot of this was born out of insecurity right or mm-hmm. or a fear of um failure or um that i was actually deep down like an idealistic person and he sort of like kind of saw through a lot of the artifice and you know we we sort of became very fast friends through taking some classes together and just kind of hanging out and um i feel like i i very quickly while he was alive got over some of my hangups about what I thought was cool, what it, what it meant to be cool. But a lot of that work really took place like in his absence. Your first descriptions of Ken, give us a, a quick window into the, the range of what it can mean to be Asian and the way the differences jump out between third and fourth generation kids, new immigrants or children of immigrants like yourself Japanese, Taiwanese, mainland China. For, for folks who aren't familiar with, you know, quote unquote, West Coast Asian, <laughs> can you describe some of the things that go into that label? Yeah. Yeah. He, I think the thing that, uh, I think one of the things that I found really like disturbing about him was just how at ease he felt. Like I felt, I think I played it cool, but I was sort of terminally, terminally ill at ease. You know, like my parents were immigrants and, you know, as, as assimilated as they were, there was a lot of things that they couldn't teach me. And Ken's family, he was Japanese American. He was, his family had been here much longer than my family had been. And he just seemed a lot more comfortable around everyone. And I think that I think when you're part of a minority group, like Asian Americans are not a huge portion of the American population, Um, but we seem to be like monolithic in the eyes of many. We scrutinize differences within our community in a way that people outside of it, like can never really understand or probably have no interest in understanding. And that's, that's 
perfectly fine too. And one of those is sort of like your sort of how comfortable you feel in your skin. And he felt very comfortable and I felt much less comfortable. And so initially, I think I read this as something like undesirable. It's like, I don't you're like too this. comfortable. This is, yeah, you're too comfortable. Um, and, you know, over time, I realized that it was just sort of a, a projection on my part that was only uh, that, that wasn't like an act that wasn't accurate, you know, that we both shared a lot of the same hopes and dreams, and anxieties. Um, but but that he he did feel like more hope and more desire to be in the world than I did, probably. Did some of that rub off on you, either that sense of comfort or lack of kind of pressure to define yourself against other things? You know, when I look back, we were friends for about three years and he died when between junior and senior year. And a lot of kind of what you're describing, that that sense of, of uh, kind of letting go of some of my hangups, like it really comes in the aftermath because in yeah. the moment you're not really thinking about the long-term effect someone is having on you because you're just busy being friends and making memories. Like it's, it's hard to reflect on friendship as it's happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but when it ends or, or when, uh, when, when there comes a need for you to think of a narrative as a narrative rather than just kind of the, the endless, the endless, uh, you know, like role of life. Uh, I think that's when I started thinking about like exactly what I had gotten out of, out of this friendship. The story may be unique among stories of college and friendship for an extended like dance break in the middle that's focused on the French pro-structuralist Derrida and his <laughs> thoughts on knowing and being known in a friendship. Yeah. And, and that is, I have to say, a heavy card to lay down. <laughs> so what what do those ideas, what does Derrida bring to the story? <laughs> uh, a couple things. So uh, <laughs> the part of the reason why I bring Derrida in or uh, other times uh, there's the philosopher Charles Taylor, like Marcel Mauss, there's all these thinkers. So I think that they're actually pretty useful in thinking about notions of like friendship or gift giving. And I mean, there is a way in which they do have a, they are kind of united with the spirit of the book, but I, there, there's also a way in which like, it's very much something that like 19, 18 year old me would have done to like needlessly bring Derrida into a conversation on something as elemental as friendship. You know, to make, to make sure that your friendship had a good solid post structuralist critique. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so there, there's a way in which it's also not necessarily like, like a joke, but you know, it, it's sort of like a nod towards like, well, this is this is like how pretentious this kid was at the age of eighteen. All of that said, the reason there's so much of it, like directly quoted in the book, is because I think that a lot of the writing. A lot of Derrida's writing is like pretty hard to understand. I would say uh -huh. it's not a not a hot take. Uh, I barely understand most of it, but when he was writing about friendship, particularly sort of commitment to collective work that friends feel, uh, the idea that a eulogy form uh, is sort of most accurate when it's actually about the deceased rather than the living. You know the this distinction between like um, the the eulogist and like the subject, because so much of eulogy becomes this sort of uh, um, not like self flattery, but you you sort of think about yourself rather than than what the world has lost in this person, um, and so much of it was written kind of closer to the end of Derrida's own life as he was looking at rival thinkers or collaborators um or or like um people who didn't influence him who are dying um it's felt incredibly meaningful actually to read this stuff and think about how Derrida really believed that these these sort of friendships that kind of weren't defined by traditional binaries or weren't defined by um 
that, that it was possible to think of friendship as this thing that we have not yet truly discovered or like that we don't truly understand yet and that there's like this political possibility to it. It was just very beautiful. I, I can't say that I totally understand what that version of friendship looks like, but that there is this sort of political possibility in honoring the kind of work that was never done um, and, and sort of carrying that out on behalf of of the deceased. And were there things that you uncovered by looking at that friendship through that very particular, very specific lens? I think a lot of, a lot of grief and a lot of, uh, I think what we miss sometimes is just sort of like sense of closure. I mean, it's sort of impossible to truly come to terms with loss, uh, you know, but I remember in that moment, all of us thinking like, oh, we never got to like say goodbye. We never got to have that final, final send off because why would you even think that such a thing would be necessary? You know, you're, you're 20, 21. So I think I was just totally obsessed with the final conversation we had and how it sort of hung in the air. Like, oh, I'll give you a call tomorrow so we can finish talking about this stuff. Um, I'll see you tomorrow so we can go do this thing. Um, there were, you know, there's like this, this like movie script that we had started, not that we'd worked on it very seriously, but all of a sudden in his absence, there were all of these unfinished things, you know, whether it was a conversation, a project, an idea that we wanted to see in the world. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think some of that theory actually gave me, made me take some of those some of those like unfinished projects more seriously. You write about Bone Thugs and Harmony's song, The Crossroads, yeah, being one of those uh, just ubiquitous like songs that would thump down college dorm halls that you did not care for, but then finding it kind of a balm, a comfort when and died. And at the same time, there were songs that you loved that that you that you just couldn't handle um, after he died. Yeah. Do those echoes persist? Do those or do those feelings even out over time? That's a good question. I don't know if they. The feelings definitely persist. I mean, this isn't necessarily like the the purpose of the book, but it is you know, like I've worked as a music critic uh, for The New Yorker and like various magazines for the past, I don't know, like 20 years at different, you know, just writing my music. But I've never, but like my, my, my musical tastes essentially changed in the aftermath of Ken's death because all of a sudden it became very difficult for me to listen to a lot of the music that I liked up until that moment. So, you know, like you mentioned Bone Thugs and Harmony, like I thought I, I found the crossroads like so annoying when it came out. Like I just thought it was a I just thought it was a this this sort of I just found it annoying. Uh I found like Puff Daddy's I'll Be Missing You, the song about Biggie, like really annoying. Um but you know, after he died, I was like, wow, these songs really express something that I feel. They're not about him at all, but because they're things that were around when we were friends, like they, there was just something about them that that captured this kind of maybe like over the top feeling of loss and uh -huh. yearning that I I really needed. And all of a sudden, all of these like indie rock seven, like these these sort of very like um, reserved like shy, brittle song, like these no longer appeal to me at all. And so it's been strange in a way because I've written about music for the past 20 years. I write a lot about like hip hop and dance music, but a lot of these things are things that I only came to really love in the way that I currently love them around that time, like in the late 1990s. Um, and so the feelings do persist, but I think I have a better understanding of 
of why I feel that way. With these events and memories more in the distance, are there other snapshots, pieces of music, you know, kind of fragments that are taking on new resonance now as you were going back over this and it, you know, looking up old writings and putting yeah. the book together? Yeah, a lot. Um, you know, I think I'm by nature a pretty nostalgic person, but it was very so like I had never used streaming services prior to writing this book. Like I was always just, you know, I have like records, CDs, iTunes. I wasn't on Spotify basically. I will own my music. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So like I I never really use any streaming services, but I wrote most of this or much of this book at the, in this office that had uh you know, it was a very old computer. So the only way I could listen to music was by using streaming services. And I would make these hyper specific playlists based on memories of like a specific month of 1996, you know, or like a specific semester of 1998. And it was really interesting because I've obviously like thought about this stuff for quite a while. Like I've been kind of writing nonstop and taking notes nonstop since, you know, essentially the day after we found out that, that Ken had been killed. But I had never really sat and like made the definitive playlist of like the summer of 1998. Right. And it was fascinating because I realized like how well I knew these like R&B songs from that summer without ever owning any of it or seeking any of it out it was just sort of like always on yeah. and and because i was just sort of making these playlists in in order to unlock these memories like i would i would remember a song all of a sudden like i would i would sort of research like what was on the radio that summer and just like make sure i had everything and then you know a month would pass i'm like oh yeah i remember another song and it would be like finding a new memory almost <laughs> and I don't know. There was something very unusual about it compared to how um, sort of control driven I usually am about my listening habits. You know, it's usually just like I'm listening to the, the exact thing I want to listen to or have to listen to. Um, whereas this was more like, all right, let's just put on this, this like four hour playlist from this that I associate with this one apartment I lived in when uh -huh. I was a sophomore and see what happens. Um, and it was really, uh, it was a, it was a huge part of the process. Have you ever thought about sharing those out, about making them part of the work? Um, some of them I've shared some of them. Uh, I think partly it's that they're, they're, they're so personal. Like they don't actually, they don't make like for good playlists, if that makes sense. Like it's a good playlist <laughs> to me because these are the exact things I was listening to, but it's not like I think like these are the best songs from like winter 1997 <laughs> like or or you're tripping up on your inner curator it's like well I mean, yeah i was i was listening to them but i mean yeah you know during the in the run-up to the book's publication last fall I, I got very obsessed with like different uh different ways of i guess promoting it yeah. um but in ways that i felt were like aligned with the spirit of the book so i was like well the obvious thing would be to be to be to make a zine because that's something that I do a lot in the book, but I didn't really want to do that. Instead, I actually made all of these fake college radio shows from like I wasn't actually a DJ at the college radio station because I found it like very intimidating. Uh -huh. Like those were my people, but I found it so intimidating that I never had the guts to like go talk to them or hang out with them. And but I, I made all these sort of fake, like this is what my radio show would have been like in 1997 and i found the psas and like what movies were playing at the uc theater and all this stuff and i just put them up randomly on um on the internet and i would just send postcards out to random people with a link to the radio show and a lot of people thought that they were actual gen actually genuine shows from back then which i thought was um you know it was good to know that i sound as awkward as as i would have as a sophomore but um, that's that was like a, a cool way to kind of return to that like musical vibration of that those moments, uh -huh. you know. 
friendships aren't transactional, but they they do interlock. You know, we fill in the gaps or we complement the strengths of our friends. There's a scene where you help Ken put together an outfit, and we get a sense of how this friendship helps him. Yeah, you know, maybe for Ken, yeah, you know, why is this? Is this yeah? You know, if kid who you know, challenges him to be less square, do you do you have a sense of of some of the things that you gave each other through that friendship? Yeah, you know, it's funny. Like, I think that is one way in which we understand friendship, right? As these um, gifts traded back and forth, and I certainly understand with much more clarity now what I got out of him. I mean, it's 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 a lot like the stuff with my dad earlier in the book that we were talking about, where you know there's just certain things you're not going to appreciate till much later. Um, and in this case, it's something that you probably, I probably didn't appreciate until like I had to, until all I was left with was like a, a shared past rather than a shared future. But I think he definitely made me a much more open-minded person. Yeah. <laughs> It, it it sounds pretty banal, but, you know, like uh, he just made me much less certain about the things I thought were cool, you know, because he was very cool in a way that had nothing to do with being into bands, you know, or being into independent film. He was just kind of uh, very comfortable around different people. He was just someone you could you could take to the record store you could go to class with, you could go to the bar with, um, and he would just be at ease in all these different environments. I was not necessarily that person. I would just sort of insist that you come with me to the record store and then wait outside the stores you wanted to go to if if I didn't think it was like, you know, my my thing. Um, I, I always wondered what he got out of my end of things because you know, although it's probably a little exaggerated in the book, I was definitely the less generous person in this friendship. You know, I mean, I think he thought that I think he found the stuff I was into like appealing, but it's not like he was going to reorient his life around this stuff. You know, like he liked the stuff I would play for him. Like I often like I often joke that he was like the only frat boy in America who had like slow dive and bell and sebastian tapes <laughs> but uh but it's not like he was then going to like reorient his whole life around like the fact that he liked you know mojave 3 or something uh -huh. and so i think he was just um he was just like a kind of relentlessly curious and pretty optimistic person and i probably was just sort of like another one of these characters that he could absorb into his life um and, and learn something from. Uh, yeah. You illustrate your own growth as a writer, as something that was was spurred by a professor, uh, Michael Rogan. And yeah. I think we can all relate to you know, the young man that you were subscribing to the magazines that he recommended, reading <laughs> his books, like just being yeah. into his stuff and the stuff he was clearly into. But he called you out on that and told you, go write. <laughs> Yeah. Do you think you would have become the writer you are now without having been seen that way and told by someone you admire to like push yourself in that direction? Uh I don't know actually. I mean, I think he I think he just wanted me to finish my thesis. Uh like I I kept just <laughs> wanting to go hang out with him and talk to him. And uh it's it's sort of funny because I'm a college professor now. And on the first day of class, a student asked if they could come to office hour. Like they're like, what, "What's your office hours policy?" And I'm like, uh, "I don't know. Just sign up and come." And they said, "Do we have to bring a finished piece of writing to discuss, or can we just come and talk about the readings and ideas?" And I said, "Well, obviously you can do either. Like, why are you asking me this?" And they said, "Because when you were in college, as you write in your book, you had a professor who told you." <laughs> that you know you should you, you got to bring some writing in. I said no 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 that was just a very that was a different situation you can just come do whatever. Um I think he definitely I don't think I would be the thinker or 
I don't think I would be who I am had it not been for this professor, Professor Michael Rogan, this class, the confidence of kind of working with someone like that. But I also don't think I would have necessarily tried to be a writer had it not been for like what followed. Like I think mm -hmm. the reason I I think like freelance writing, journalism, it's pretty it's it's a pretty um unstable path and it's not been sort of my sole occupation all these years but i think my desire to just kind of continue down that path was it was, it was more out of this sense of like well i got it i have all this stuff i'm trying to process from ken's death and and the writing i was doing like that week and and, and the months that followed and the and that and my senior year um what am I supposed to do with this? Like how do, what can, can all of this journaling, like, is there some, something meaningful here for me? Like, mm -hmm. did, can I figure something out about why I was so affected by this by returning to it through writing? Um, so that was definitely, I think the thing that actually pushed me all of these years. You've said you don't read memoirs that much and you think you misremember a lot. Yeah. And I think that's a a pretty normal thing that we don't talk about because you know, we know memoirs exist and most of us haven't written them. Um but we think there's something wrong with our own memories, but everybody else is like remembering things perfectly. How did you go from doubting your memory to writing this book, yeah, you know, knowing the memory's imperfect? I tried to write most of it from memory like i'm still friends with i would say 80 to 90 percent of the people in the book and so you know one memoir i have read that i really liked is um bill finnegan's barbarian days it's this it's uh he's this political writer but he's also been this avid surfer and so it's about sort of his life through surfing and I think he re-reported his life. Like he went back and interviewed all of his friends, like all of these people he he he'd known as a surfer over his over like I don't know fifty years. And I realized that even though I could do that in this case, because initially I thought of this as like I'm telling our story, I'm telling like the story of like this group of friends. That what what you know, like disturbed me or haunted me was actually just like the faultiness of memory. And mm -hmm. that it it wasn't that I needed, it wasn't that I wanted to know what everyone remembered. It was that, or it's not that I needed to sort of like triangulate with certainty, like when things happened or how things happened, but I was working through my own fixation on my own memories. And so like part of it is uh, you know, like how close, how close were Ken and I? Like, the, the, like it doesn't matter what anyone else has to say about that. That's a that's a sense of doubt that I think we have. You know, every day with like the people in our lives, like how close, how how well do I actually know my closest friend? Like how well, how do am I remembering all the things they're remembering? Are we are we in this moment together? Uh -huh. And and that's something that I think I was immediately thinking about when he died was just kind of like, did we leave? Did, was it was it on bad terms? Like, were we going to drift apart? Like, we're going to be seniors. Like, would we have stayed close? You know, like all these questions that I think would have just resolved themselves naturally all of a sudden become, uh, you start thinking about the past in a very different way. And so- when I wrote the book, I was just very interested in kind of my own memory, but I had also written so much down over this period of time. Like I was just constantly writing a journal, like writing, writing on my computers. Um, so I had this account of how, of what I was remembering in like 2002, about 1998. You know what okay. I mean? Like there, there are times in like 2001 where I think, where I write, Oh man, like I miss what like November 1998 felt like because at that point I could remember X, Y, and Z 
but now I can't remember that anymore. And I read back and I'm like, well, I don't even remember either of these things. And, and so I was, I think I wanted the book to have some of that sense of doubt as well. Um, so, you know, there, there are moments when people, and, and there are things that actually happen where people ask me like, well, how close were you really? Or like, may, are you sure you're remembering this correctly? Um, and it was important for me to include that stuff because I think a lot, something that people say a lot <laughs> after they read the book is like, I can't remember how much, I can't believe how much you remembered. And on one hand, that's true. Like, I think I do remember a lot of very random things, but I think it's an open question for the reader, like how much my, like how accurate all of these memories are. So, so let me take that one level deeper. You've had to talk about your book a lot, which I imagine means both accessing memories, not just that you wrote down, but yeah. the, uh, the process of digging those memories up in the first place. So what happens to you know, to that, that picture of the past when you spend six months or more talking about it day after day? That's a great question. And, you know, if we'd done this interview three months ago, it would have been like totally different. I, I think it's a strange facet of memoir or personal writing that you essentially turn yourself and other people into characters. And the more other people kind of react to those characters or tell me how they relate to those characters, uh, the more distant I think I feel from like who that character was originally supposed to be. Does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. like I have a very, like I understand who I am and who Ken was and sort of continues to be in my mind. And then there's the version of us that exists in this book as characters, you know, along with like a slew of other friends who were generally like many of them were like quite delighted to see <laughs> or like amused to see themselves represented this way. Uh, some, some less so, but th these are all like characters and I think the more I talk about the characters, the more they become characters that are like alien to me as well, uh, which isn't a bad thing. I mean, I think it's really, like, it's very moving to me to hear people relate to him and admire him in ways that, um, you know, that was, that was really the only real point of this was just to say like, Hey, there's this, there's this dude you've never met. He, he was great and he deserved a lot more. And so to see people or to like engage with people who feel that way is it's like incredible. Like he he'll never be forgotten by these people who never met him. Um, it's just sort of a strange facet of writing, I guess, that you become these like archetypes to people. There's a line in the last chapter where you say, you know, the more I wrote about Ken, the more he became someone else. Is that is that that process that you're describing? Yeah, definitely. Um, Although I think in his case, the person he became through this process of writing is like, like that character has been corroborated to me by so many people uh -huh. that I don't think it's like, I don't think it's, uh, I think it's like a very authentic portrayal of him, if that makes sense. The distance is is more that like I feel less of an intimate connection to him. Does that make sense? Like, okay. like I've heard from you know when I've heard from like mutual friends as well as people I never met who took a class with him at Berkeley who will email me and say like I remember him, I remember that summer. Uh, I agree, he was like <laughs> like smart, compassionate, and handsome. You know, like people yeah. who will corroborate these memories. Um, I think the only thing for me is that like the relationship that I had with him now feels like very distant because it's now like 
a story that people can enter into from outside. And that's not a bad thing, but it just it's just kind of weird. And de- and describing something is a is a crystallization of it too, right? You're yeah. you're out of the fluidity of memory and you're into locking it down. And it's yeah. a it's a different quality. Did you experience that happening to yourself in a way as your you, as you put yourself in that story? Yeah, I definitely I definitely feel that a lot because I remember, you know, there's a reason it's called interiority. Like it's not, it's not like there's, there's the version of you that you put out in the world. It'll never align with who you think you are. You know, it's, it's more an expression of who you want to be maybe. And, and so it's, it's kind of funny because I definitely feel like for the sake of narrative, there's probably aspects of like my younger self that is like m- more judgmental than I actually was, you know, or more, more this. Like it's just sort of like the levels are turned up a little bit. Um, everything is sort of probably in in a more vivid hue than it, it actually was. Um, and again, I think that's just kind of how memory works too. Like you, I remember the most embarrassing things that happened to me as a 17 or 18 year old, but I don't necessarily dwell on like the everyday. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. This was a, a real delight. I've been speaking with Wa Shu, author of the memoir, Stay True. Find it at kobo.com slash conversation. Check the show notes for a link. Subscribing to the show is easy, and so is telling a friend. Both are helpful, so it's up to you. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Tamlin. Thank you for listening.